get started, we'll start with some opening introductions. Uh, I am Sam Goodman. A lot of you know me as the Hop Nerd. Uh, so thank you for joining us. I'm going to uh, kind of just kind of kick things off here. Uh, again, this is Making Safety Entertaining. We're going to have a discussion around that. As I mentioned, as we were just getting started, this is an open Q&A session. So please feel free, jump in, ask questions, drop questions into the comment box. Uh, you can direct questions just openly to the panel or to everyone. You can do that as well. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, let's see. That's a little bit about me. Let's jump over to our panelists. We're joined by Jason Lucas, James McPherson, Abby Ferry, and Jay Allen, as you just heard Jay jump on there as well. So we can go ahead and get started with introductions. Jason, why don't you go ahead and tell everybody a little bit about who you are? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm Jason Lucas. I'm part of the Safety Justice League. I do content creation, a social media safety minute. I'm also kind of known as the uh, soul doctor and I am a super fun guy, according to <laughs> Sam Goodman. And uh, so, yeah, no, I just, I, I just try to make safety as entertaining as I can try to make sure that it's uh, an understandable uh, profession. And uh, you know, so I'm, I'm just excited to be here. I'm excited to answer questions. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, that was that's a fun story about how we come up with that super fun guy thing. That was <laughs> hashtag super fun guy, Jason Lucas. Move on to James. Why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself, James? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is James McPherson. I'm the, the novel British voice that we have on the panel. On the panel. Uh, so I, I run a podcast called uh, Rebranding Safety, which essentially, from when I interviewed Sam, uh, it's, it's pretty much the English version of the hop nerd because we're extremely similar in how we look at things and apparently how we dress as well. And I think even our family backgrounds are extremely similar, uh, which is really scary. Uh, but yeah, my, uh, my aim is to rebrand health and safety. Uh, I don't mean that no one else is doing that, but we just, uh, yeah, looked at the industry in the UK and I thought, I don't really feel like I fit in this and thought let's, let's start a podcast and that's it really. Hey, thanks, James. Yeah, it's uh, as we started to get to know each other a little bit better, we discovered some eerie similarities, that's for sure. <laughs> we'll move on to, uh, to Abby, Abby Ferry. James, there's a place for you. You're with us. <laughs> um, hey, I'm Abby Ferry. I am also with the Safety Justice League. I'm based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And so I guess I'm the, the, the Midwest accent of the panel. <laughs> Happy to be here and talk about fun things I like to do with safety. Great. Thank you, Abby. We'll move on to Jay Allen. Well, here's the fun part. You're not going to see a picture of me, so that's going to be, I'll be the voice behind <laughs> everything. That's kind of the way it normally goes. So you can wave for me, by the way, digging the misfit shirt. By the way, my name is Jay Allen. Um, I actually, I guess I'm an industrial and organizational psychologist is mostly what I'm known for. And I do host some shows on Safety FM and have some broadcasters on the station as well. I'd love, to, I'd love to hear some of the questions that are out there today on how we can make safety entertaining. Great. Thanks, Jay. So we'll, with that, we'll go ahead and get started. So um, what we'll go ahead and do, we'll open up for questions. We'll open up for questions again to the chat box. For those folks that just want to jump in and ask questions, just feel free, unmute, jump in. Please just remember to mute yourself. And then we'll just start having an open conversation with our panelists here about how we believe that we can make safety entertaining. And we'll, we'll weave those questions in between some of that discussion. Let me ask this uh, to the group because I think it was interesting that James brought it up. Um, what started a lot of you guys down this path of trying to do safety a little maybe differently than the rest of the herd, right? Because I think most of us probably fall into that category that we wanted to do things a little bit differently. What started you down that path? I'll go. Um, for me, uh, working with construction populations, I knew that I had to do things differently because of just the time. Um, often I was given 10 minutes to do literally anything. Um, so you have an eight hour training. Good. Let's make it a tailgate meeting. You need a four hour refresher. Awesome. Make it a tailgate meeting. <laughs> and so, um, out of necessity, uh, I've had to make things entertaining. Um, also because I'm often not the voice or the, the, person, the type of person that the workers were used to seeing up in front of them and giving them safety messages. So um, I guess in that sense, I was already giving them something different and often have been brought in just for having a different voice, just bringing in a woman instead of having a guy um, in front of the workers. So um, I like to bring in a, a like a, a activity aspect to my training and to my messaging 
um, with safety. So maybe people want to talk about that a little bit too on different activities that they bring into the into training or just into messaging for safety. Uh, as for me, I'm going to follow up. That's great, great stuff, Abby. For me, um, I was I was listening to a lot of safety people share safety messaging. And those of you that are that are on here right now live and those that are probably listening will will recognize this this look. Yeah, that was that was me falling asleep because I just could not stay awake in some of their messaging. So I figured out that you had to be a lot more entertaining. You had to, to find a way to simplify the message so it was understood and and start. I mean, just give the training in the way that you talk. Like make it entertaining, make it fun, and just make it understandable. So that that was that was my road to making it different. Uh, I think I think for me, uh, kind of, I, I alluded to it a minute ago. But you know, when I I kind of was I don't know about seven years into my career, I was looking around and thinking, oh, this doesn't fit me. Like this, the, the perception of health and safety was not me. And I was just like, and I play rugby as well. So you can imagine being the health and safety professional at a rugby club. Um, that's for the, for the Americans on the call. That's basically the, the better version of American football where we don't wear protection and stuff because um, we're hard. Um, oh, but basically you, wow. can, <laughs> you can imagine being at a rugby club and uh, getting the, we call it banter. Uh, you know, like you, you can't tackle him because you, you did your wrist test that. Is that why you didn't tackle him and all that rubbish? So, um, and long story short, I just surrounded by those kind of banter mates and, you know, all my friends are sole traders and small business owners and stuff. So they just didn't get it. Uh, and then over beers and all this stuff are just chatting away. And I was saying, no, that's not what health and safety is, what you're thinking or what it is. That's not what it is. Um, and, and they were like, oh, actually, yeah, a couple of years on, convinced me that it's right. And a friend of mine said, you should try and tell other people to do that. I was going to start a blog, realize I can't spell. And then somebody told me about podcasts and boom, there we go. It sounds like we started podcasts for similar reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, you could just say what he said. You know that Judas legitimately you know, you know that Judas legitimately said on record that you don't know how to spell. So knew we're gonna hold you to this later down the road, right? That's, that's fine. It's not a spelling bee, is it? Like, if, otherwise, it I need to. Well, that, I, I, I thought that was. I thought that was part of the thing. I was only going to do it in Spanish. Definitely not in English. <laughs> uh, J James has left the call. <laughs> <laughs> I got to say, it's a, a lot of the reasons for me is very similar, though. Um, a lot of the stuff that everyone was just kind of touching on. I mean, for me, I kind of looked at the profession. I started in the profession uh, at, at a, a significantly younger age than most. Um, and when I started, I was like, okay, this is, this is dry. Why has it got to be so boring? Right. That's a question that I asked all the time and it always got me in trouble. <laughs> it's like, because it has to be, <laughs> that's, that's usually the answer that we've gotten. Right. Is that because I don't know, that's the way we've always done it. Uh, and most of you that tune in and hang out with me, you, you probably understand that I don't care for that answer that <laughs> just that I might push back a challenge a little bit. And I did, right. I think that that was something that, uh, that for me, I, I, I didn't understand why it had to be boring. I didn't understand why it had to be different when we come to work, right? The stuff that works outside of work works at work too, right? The same aspects that we use uh, in social media, all those different things that we use in our personal life, all those ways that we communicate outside of work, those things work at work as well. Um, for some reason, we stopped and would say, oh, no, it works different. We can't do that stuff here. It has to be corporate. It has to be dry. It has to be like we're getting a letter from the bank. We can't, we can't do things, you know, like normal human beings at work. Um, so when I looked in and seen all that stuff, I was like, that's just unacceptable, right? So that's really what pushed me down that path. Um, that and not seeing myself in our profession, right? I, I, don't, I don't mean to uh, kind of pick on anyone, but I didn't see the young safety professional represented very well, much less the young safety professional that liked punk rock and had tattoos, right? I just, I didn't, I didn't see that person represented in, in the profession very much, right? Uh, hi, Sam. Again, hi. <laughs> <laughs> Not as many tattoos, but right there with you. Right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So when you look into that, you're going, okay, well, I know that I exist out there, right? I know it's not just me yeah, to, to that point, right? I know it's not just me. I know there are others of me out there, right? So how do we reach each other? How do we do that, right? So, um, but yeah, I, I think that that was really important to kind of go down that path of 
or for me, it was important to start to bring in those lessons or bring in those ideas that we use outside of work to work, to better communicate, to better provide, spread messages, right? I, I share that all the time, um, you know, when it comes to uh, implementation of stuff, right? That's something we talk a lot about in safety. We pretend like it's different, but it's not. Everything, everything in change management is one big PR campaign. Everything in change management is one big PR campaign, and we forget that lesson when we come to work. So that's kind of my long rambly rant as to how I kind of found found myself there. I'm really interested in the hearing from uh, from Dr. Jay Allen, uh, as as I get in trouble for coining him this, but the king of all safety media. I would like to <laughs> I'd like to hear from Dr. Jay Allen, see how he got into this thing. Oh God, you have to stop calling me that. You're gonna get me in trouble. No, I, I'll have to tell you, and I know my camera view is gonna be a little bit different than most, so I do apologize because we're, we're kind of flipping back and forth. Um, really what it boiled down to, it was a kind of a hot mess type of thing. I kept on looking around inside of the industry and I was trying to look for something that I deemed quote unquote entertaining and something that I wanted to listen to. So I kept on looking and going, okay, this is not the version of safety that I'm looking for. Now keep in mind that prior to getting to this to that particular standpoint, I had a pretty catastrophic event that had occurred at one of the at one of the work sites that I was at. So I kept on looking at it and going, okay, I can go to these different organizations and get their content. And some of it's very inspiring, but I'm looking more along the lines of what can we do for it to be able to change and how we can actually affect people in real conversation modes. Not the not the format that, you know, some people thought that a child should be taught, but how do you do it as adult learning how do you do it in the format where it's adult learning and entertaining so it's like entertainment and education so it's i kept on looking at it from that standpoint and said well, we have to do first before we get out there something serious for people to really kind of respond to okay here's the seriousness of everything and then move forward into more of the entertainment side of it but still being it more along the lines of what i thought I would want to listen to that maybe some others would want to look at too. Now I was not as open as Sam starting off. I did not show my tattoos to the world. I kind of always looked at it and went, what are people going to think? And I was the long sleeve guy and all that kind of fun stuff. And then I just got to the point where I said, well, it's all a little bit of me. So I think people should see a little bit of my personality of not always being, you know, the quote unquote PC type person. I think that's, that's a super interesting comment too. I, and it's just a little side story. Um, for the longest time, um, most folks that are, are live, you know, I mean, you can see, you've seen me, right? And there's a lot more that you can't say. <laughs> but for the longest time, to Jay's point, I didn't want to get stuck in long sleeve shirts. I, 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 my, my tattoos purposely ended right here. You can see kind of the, the letter and they stopped right there because my polo shirts, my starchy polo shirts would cover up to, the, <laughs> up to that point when I would go out <laughs> and work, right? So inter interesting. I think it's really interesting to hear how we all kind of found ourselves because there was, as we kind of went down this path, I thought it was this group of folks. When I close my eyes and think about the people that I think about that make safety entertaining, this group is a cross section of those people, right? So I think it's really cool uh, to get to have all these different perspectives together. <clears throat> so we'll jump over to the, to the comment section um, and dive into a little bit of the questions. Um, this one was sent. How do you go about making it fun with a language barrier? Anybody have any input on that? Pictures. Lots of fun pictures. Yeah. Videos. Yeah. How-to videos. Leg Lego. I've used Lego quite a lot. Uh, and I think it's much bigger in America than it is in the UK. But it's called it Lego Serious Play. Um, I don't really do it as serious as that because it costs you about four grand i think to become a, a an official facilitator or something like that's crazy expensive and uh, like yeah I, I i wouldn't have brought it if it was 40 quid if i'm honest but it's um <laughs> i uh I, I sometimes you get like a, a little bag of bricks and, and i use this to to make the decision around perception of uh of, of doing a risk assessment and different people's perceptions of risk and things like that and uh, it's basically like a little yellow duck so everyone gets the same amount of bricks um a couple of yellow ones a couple of red ones and then we give them out around the room and say right build a duck now a duck is pretty universal they look the same everywhere none of them are yellow and red and square so you know lego doesn't help us there but that aside it's interesting because you'll get a room and nobody we'll build the same duck. I think I've been doing this exercise for years and I've twice had uh, one, uh, two people build the same duck in a room. Um, but it, it then leads you to down a really interesting conversation where people do things differently. Um, there's another exercise where you can just give people a 
bucket of mixed bricks uh, and just say, build your job um, or something like that. And, and they build their job and you get a real interesting insight as they explain what they've built uh, as to how they perceive their job. And sometimes I think when you're, when you're trying to mix different, in, uh, maybe different industries or maybe even within that business, the different roles, say like maintenance and machine operators or something like that, how they kind of build their job is fascinating. So I, Lego is one of my favorite things to do. That's awesome. I wrote that one down. I've never incorporated Lego into training, but I think that's super cool. Do it. Yeah. I've got like two massive boxes of Lego in my house. So I haven't even got a kid yet. It's on the way. I can't <laughs> wait to have a kid just for the excuse to buy more Lego. And so I, step I, on the Lego. I, th I, thought you, I thought you were going to say Jenga because Jenga seems to be the popular thing around. Okay. I've got a Jenga sitting on my shelf behind me. So Jenga, <laughs> Jenga, it does work well like that. There's because there's just there's just so much conversation you can have around Jenga, right? There's so many different different ways you can take Jenga, uh, especially as you go down hop and HPI training, right? There's just so many different talking perspectives, right? Looking down upon the bricks rather than from the side, right? You can see all the holes looking down. You don't see all that the management just sees this nice perfect square. There's all kinds of different ways you can you can take Jenga. Um, the one that I've been playing with quite a bit is Mr. Potato Head. Right in and around, kind of when, when just just a blast. Right, anytime that you're assembling anything, right. So we'll we'll do the stuff where we're we kind of couple a bunch of things together to show how easy it is to to create errors. Right, have somebody blindfolded with like these nice big kind of like googly eyed spray painted over safety glasses and big gloves and load them up in PPE and give them this crazy wonky procedure, and then have folks instruct them on how to put together potato heads. It's it's just it's a blast. I can share this with anyone offline if you'd like. I've got some of this stuff written up. I'll, I'll can send it to some folks in the group if you reach out to me. Um, but yeah, I, I love those. Buckaroo at that as well. Buckaroo. What? Do you have that, that game? Where, like, I'm thinking around. I've never done this, but I'm thinking around like capacity and things like that. Like you're, you're, you're. I don't know. I'm thinking out loud here. So like, <laughs> yeah. you, you you put stuff on the buckaroo, don't you? And then all of a sudden, it kicks it all off. So like, if you were to try and have a conversation around how much you pushing people to their capacity or pushing machines to their capacity, I don't know. I think buckaroo might be a good one there. Hey, I'm learning. I'm learning, so, man. I'm going to get all the games so out. So the best thing that I can take from this is that we use children's games to explain how they don't really all look the same. Oh, good. I'm, I'm ready. Let's go. I got lots of – I got four sure. kids. I got four kids. I got plenty of games that I can figure out to make this work. Exactly. I mean, I was just going to talk about a toilet paper roll and, and you know, grabbing you – know, I'm going to leave that one alone. I'm going to leave that one okay, alone. Okay, Jason, can we get Jason, can we come up with a game with Hungry Hungry Hippo? Could, is there something that we could tie in using that? That's one of my favorite games. Hungry Hungry, of course you can. <laughs> Look, it's all about near misses, Jay Allen, okay? So every ball that the hippo eats is representative of a near miss. So the more that you are able to capture – the more that you're able to, to feed that hippo of safe work. Look at that. Right there on the spot, you're able to come up to in real time. I love it. I love it. That was but then I'm scared of being called the safety hippo lady. So I'm going <laughs> to <careful. laughs> good, good call. Good call. Didn't think about I, it that I already, way. I already get Here comes that crazy Sam guy with his, uh, with his Mr. Potato Heads, his trunk full of Mr. Potato Heads. <laughs> No, that's What's interesting. That game I think with the monkeys as well. What's that game with the where you put all the monkeys in the top and you pull the the bits out? I reckon you could use that to describe the like the Swiss cheese model if you wanted to go down that route. Like the the more stuff you're taking away, and then there's more holes, and then everything co collapses. I, I'm not as good as Jason, but I'm just thinking out loud here. But I mean, I'm just in awe. Of I was going to say, what ga what game is this? Here. What game is this? I'm not is sure. It barrel, is it barrel? Is it barrel of monkeys? I can't. Yeah, I think, I think it is. Yeah, yeah. You pull so. the monkeys in the top, and then and then you just pull the, the, the sticks out, and then and then it's like I don't really understand the game if I'm honest. Like, it was well, that almost sounds like that marble the marble game that exists. There was like a marble game that you could put stuff in. That one I'm familiar with, but I haven't heard of the one with the monkeys. That's pretty interesting. Pedro oh, said it's monkeys in a barrel. Played with marbles. <laughs> monkeys in a barrel. Oh, monkeys in a barrel. All right, and I think and we've moved on from marbles since like the yeah. 50s or something. <laughs> I think I think that's one one interesting place to get back to that question a little bit was, um, you know, the, my first few years in Arizona. I came to Arizona about ten years ago, um, and when I first came to Arizona, I was in northern Arizona, uh, and a significant portion of the Navajo Nation exists in Arizona, um, and this, a lot of the sites that I uh, spent 
my first few years in Arizona at uh, were on Navajo reservation. They were on Navajo land and obviously had Navajo higher preference, you know, at 80, 90% of the locations were Navajo and <clears throat> I don't speak Navajo. <laughs> right? So back to, back to that language barrier, I'm going to take this, I'm, I'm going to take it a little bit farther than even the activities for me what really helped me bridge that gap of communication was trust. That was the huge place that helped me bridge that gap because I would, I would walk into a room and people would go from speaking English to speaking Navajo as soon as I would walk into the room. Right. And I get that. I totally understand that there was no trust there. Right. And once they started, you know, in that exercise of building environments in which we could create honesty environments in which trust was at least present or at least started to be present, um, folks would actually start to continue to communicate with me. I would actually had kind of impromptu translators that would spring up <laughs> out of the groups, right, and help facilitate those conversations. So um, all the stuff we're talking about with activities is phenomenal. I mean, I think that's a great way to engage folks and demonstrate points that kind of move us beyond the language barrier. But so mm -hmm. much of that still is still predicated on trust and the ability to be open and honest. I think that's interesting. And that kind of goes in line with what you said earlier, Sam, about kind of covering up your tattoos and stuff like that. Like you're, you're, you're trying to, you're trying to create a perception of yourself, which is not yourself. So, so you're not authentic. You're, it's not you that they're starting to build a relationship with. And I think if, if they don't like you or they don't, or they have maybe a perception of you, which doesn't fit you before you're even there, they've turned off. And that's really interesting. You know, they, right. they, they go to their native language before you're even in the room. That's fascinating. So that, that perception was so impactful to them. The, the, the second you walked in the room, they were like, don't want to talk to Sam. Whereas, you know, if they'd have probably given you an opportunity to, to learn who you are, as opposed to your profession, um, I, think, I think that would have made a massive difference. Right, exactly. And you can imagine, um, I, I could only imagine the horrors that that, that workforce had been to, to get to the point mm -hmm. to where that was the norm, <laughs> right? You can, you can only imagine how bad it must have been, right? And so there, there was a lot of, uh, not to dive too deep down that story, but there was a lot of work that had to be done there. And as I said, the, 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 the benefit to that was that trust was, or at least the ability, I, I won't say trust, I'll say at least the ability to be honest was now there. Folks were at least trusting enough to where, Folks would just step up and, and just start translating, right? I mean, it was it was interesting. It was a pretty interesting thing. Um, I wanted to dive into the uh, to the the questions here a little bit. Lego is more painful it's to step on than hot coals and broken glass. I think that's an interesting true. comment. That's very true. <laughs> uh, I have a, I have a five year old. I I know that feeling very well. Um, Barbies aren't much better. I'll say that. <laughs> let's, just, let's just say that right now. Sam, just on that on the uh, on the one we were just dis discussing. Sorry, I just thought of a really interesting uh, story nope, that. W we did some training with a local fire service in the UK, um, which unfortunately and ironically has been shut down since we, since we built it because uh, of health and safety, ironically. Uh, but it was around uh, fire safety. And essentially, we partnered up with a fire service and they had their training facilities where, which were designed to send you know, trainee firefighters into this building. They set it on fire and you rescue people. Now, we were doing a lot of work with people that manage properties and we were trying to get the message over to them as why they need to manage communal spaces and their fire doors and the impact of stuff. So we said, is there any way that we can actually make a live event, like a real fire and show them why it's so important to manage these means of escapes, to manage fire doors and compartmentation? And they were like, yeah, we can. We, uh, so we built a fire fire service perspective day where you went there, you you put the BA on, like the whole lot. Um, you had your hard hat, uh, you had your hard hats on. You had the overalls. You you became a firefighter for the day, um, and we got a massive increase in uh, in proactive management of fire safety because they've been they've been told about these messages for years and years and years, but now they felt it. They literally felt the heat in their face. They literally saw the smoke traveling through the doors. So sometimes I think as, if we can be as physical and as real as possible, um, then that'd be amazing. I think Universal Studios are amazing. Like Universal Studios in, I think they've got Tokyo Universal. I might be wrong. It's a, one of the uh, Asian countries. And they've got um, what they used to have. Remember the film Backdraft? Um, that they've got a backdraft ride or they used to have a backdraft ride. They probably got rid of it now, but wouldn't that be amazing to have people to train 
to teach them what backdraft is to so go on a ride like that now obviously that's big budget but it puts into perspective that sometimes you're learning and you don't even realize you're learning right uh, it, you know, it's it's not it's not as hands-on or physical but um, one thing that i've seen quite a bit of i'm, I'm actually i'm actually uh deep into right now myself um with uh my my day job uh, is we're actually rolling out vr training throughout our organization and we've been doing that for the past several years. We're just at the point to where we're taking it organization wide. We've done it in some of their some of our nuclear plants at the moment. Um, and so VR training is becoming very, very cool. Um, the, the cool part that we're at right now is that trying to take that beyond just general hazard recognition training. Because I'm, I, I'm, I'm sorry, when I hear hazard recognition training, I kind of go that, right? I'm, it's kind of data just kind of old and doesn't work very well, right? Pointing at hazards and say, watch out for hazards doesn't really stop people from falling into hazards. But <clears throat> that's a whole nother story. But we can, you know, we're, we're taking that farther into making training just more immersive, right? We're taking it farther, even if it's just 10 or 15 minutes in a headset. If that, if you've ever been in one of these headsets, you'll realize that 10 or 15 minutes is quite a long time, right? So we started down this path of putting people in them for like a half an hour and realized it's probably not good. And then we scaled that way back and really just trying to get into those really, really critical touch points and really trying to focus on those places where it makes sense to do VR training. And it's in those things. What we found is for our folks that go out and do tasks infrequently, especially, right? The folks that are, uh, we have a, a pretty significant office staff that's not used to going out into a, a power generating facility, right? We have a, a, a pretty significant office staff that's not used to walking out on a turbine deck, right? And, and looking at those, that equipment or being familiar with that. And uh, you can put them at least in a headset in a safe, kind of a safe space, and at least kind of bridge the gap before you just take them out there in the middle of summer on top of an exposed turbine deck in Arizona in 120 degree heat, right? And say, hey, here's what it looks like, you know? <laughs> so it's, it's, it's pretty cool to kind of to your point in that immersive experience to start seeing that stuff starting to happen. So it's pretty cool to see us starting to go down that path. So it, uh, Jay had mentioned um, adult learning theory or adult learning principles. And it's funny because um, making training entertaining actually isn't part of adult learning principles at all, yet it's something that we all seem to strive for. So um, there's some interesting things out there and I always come back to the adult learning principles on how adults want to guide their own training and how they want to have their experience recognized and acknowledged. And there's a couple of resources that I use. Um, I use the website Safety Fundamentals and she always posts um, like at least one book, one of her uh, activity books for free, like once a quarter or more often. And she's got some really great learning activities that you can use. And it's more so to get the workers together. So you get the workers talking. And um, my husband is an English teacher for middle school and high school. And he always tells me, don't work harder than your students. And so whenever I feel like I'm straining, like, oh, this class is so difficult, I think of that. And then I try to get the students together. And then it also satisfies adult learning theory that they like to have their experiences acknowledged and recognized and, and share their experiences and direct their learning. So, you know, there's lots of really cool tools that we can use, but always, I think it's good if you have people together to use that um, to your advantage to get them together. And then the other resource I wanted to share was about the um, other languages. And so for Spanish language stuff, um, there's a company out there called Red Angle Spanish, and he's got some really great resources on, especially for construction related stuff, um, on translations and just how to do better um, at your construction site Spanish. No, that's solid. Good, good stuff. Excellent stuff. Especially to point us back in the direction of the principles. Absolutely. Um, one, the one that I wanted to jump over to here is dive into a little bit of the questions. Uh, this is from Monica. It says, I am a new, I'm new to the safety profession. I graduated a year ago and I'm learning this career path. What would you tell safety professionals like me starting in this profession to focus on to make safety fun at work and not redundant? Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll start this one because here, here's one thing that I've learned. Don't talk like a lawyer. Um, that's, that's, that's the first way you can make things fun. That was one of my biggest frustrations in safety when I first got in it is, is every program, every policy, every letter, every email sounded as if a lawyer had formatted it and sent it rather than a human being talking, not saying that lawyers aren't human. They are, but they don't write like humans. They write like robots. So that would be the first thing I would say is, is one, write and, and speak in a, in a normal, 
uh, normal inflection, normal tone, normal communication style versus sound like a lawyer, and then focus on building relationships. You can't have fun with people that, that you don't have a relationship with. That, think about it. When you go to the pub or you go to the bar, you go with people you have a relationship with. You go and hang out with people that you're going to have fun with because you have a relationship with them. So take the time to build the relationship with your workers so that the safety that you try to push or try to, to implement in the field, it becomes fun because they know that they can have fun with you because they have a relationship with you and you don't talk like a lawyer. So is yeah, anybody going to plug, I'm, is any is I'm, anyone going to plug Sam's book? I would go with Sam's book. I would say start off by reading yeah. Sam's book. It's a really good portion to where to start off at because it has really good content on what to expect inside of this field. Well, look at that, Sam. I was, so avoiding, you, I was, you, I was you, avoiding the shameless plug, but... You should probably just read Sam's book, Monica. I mean, yeah. that's where you start. <laughs> this portion I, of the show is brought to you by. <laughs> I think Sam it's, did uh, say before we started, everyone has to uh, plug the book. That, that's why we're allowed on the panel. Exactly. No. <laughs> People are going to walk away and think that actually occurred. Now that's going to be terrible. <laughs> no, that's, that didn't happen. I think I think Jason. Well, up, well, well hold on, hold on. You, you know that we are with one of the number one selling artists, or excuse me, authors right now on Amazon. He's probably going to be too humble to say it, but I will actually say that for him. He is listed as the number one selling author on in Amazon under his category. So he does have some good words there on what's going on. And I actually, I just, I just wanted to say you're welcome, Sam. Um, the thank way you. that I pushed your book, <laughs> thank you. thank I you. really yeah. feel like I pushed it over that the top. So, so Sam, you're welcome. I really hope that you're enjoying your <laughs> success you so as a number one selling author. Uh, you're welcome. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, let's be realistic too. Inside of the safety space, all you have to do is sell about 35 books to become number one. But that's a whole other story. We can leave it at that. Yeah, I, I yeah, like. I didn't uh, want to say that. I, I think I, I, heard, that. I, th I think I heard actually Todd say that Todd Conklin said that at some point, right? That uh, uh, that, that you know you only had to sell about thirty five, and I think uh, similar to him, I think my mom bought about fifteen. So I think uh, right, that's that's exactly <laughs> his line that his mom bought yeah. them all. I was going to say, you know, you've only got to sell thirty five copies, and on that note, Sam's got thirty five copies. He's looking to give away for free. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. <laughs> But no, what I I don't know how I, I don't know how so going back into what we're talking about now. <laughs> well, I, I was actually going to uh, I was actually going to completely wholeheartedly agree with what Jason said. I think the the main thing to focus on is building relationships. I think you, how if I think back to I've been in safety for about eight to nine years now, and when I was started for so long, it was so technical. Everything was focused on technical, technical, technical. And I was walking around. I look back now on some of like say the training packages that I would deliver, and it's like the first slide the health and safety at work act section two line four subcat and i'm just like i'm falling asleep do you know what i mean and that's my own work so uh, you know i yeah, i don't know whether it's any different in, in in america but in the uk we are forced down that route of compliance in the beginning yeah. um yeah. and now now i'm realizing you know this is all about relationships this is all about them feeling comfortable with me um and building that relationship so they feel comfortable to say hey, I'm not comfortable with something. But then also, I think the important thing is, if you've got those relationships, you get that kind of comfortable communication chain is. But the conversation shouldn't be around safety. The conversation should be around work. You know, there's, there's so many people in the safety two space now we're talking about this stuff. But it's, go down there and just say, hey, what are you doing? Don't go down there and be like, hey, how are you? By the way, have you done that risk assessment? Go down there and be like, hey, do you want a coffee? Let's sit down and have a chat. How's work today? you know, any problems, anything I can change, they're most probably going to turn around and say, yeah, this really dusty safety folder that's under the machine is in the way. I think that's my, my kind of rant more than advice, but I, I, hopefully that will help. I, I echo that from when I first started in the field, that was exactly my question is that I would just say, hey, what are you doing? What's that? <laughs> and of course, being a woman, um, asking mostly men these questions, they often wanted to talk about their job incessantly. Um, <laughs> and so I would just take notes and sometimes they were saying good stuff. Sometimes they were saying some bad stuff. And, you know, I'd try to use that information for good, 
you know, to, to pick out if there's different processes or different, um, different tools or uh, PPE or just other ways that um, they could be doing things because they had the ideas. And then it was up to me because then I had access to the budget. So if they're complaining about gloves or glasses, like, hey, I'm the person that can go and bring you a bunch of samples so you can tell us what you want. And um, that was a, a way for me to quickly get, gain that trust of the workers and keep them talking to me. Because why do they want to talk to the safety person? They don't. <laughs> so yeah, I, you have to try. I think, I think all of that is so valid because um, just to echo a little bit of what everyone said so far is that um, when you first start down this path, it's very easy to fall into that, that piece that Jason was touching on to kind of write everything in legalese to kind of fall into this path of, because that's what your organization would mostly like for you to do. I'm, I'm not going to, let's not, let's not sugarcoat it. Most organizations will almost push you into that corner of you being forced to do that because when stuff happens, maybe not the way we wanted things to happen, that's kind of the first question. Do we have the piece of paper that, that, that exempts us from this and covers us for this and see why that and this and the other, and you almost get pushed into this kind of legal corner, right? And the organization's lawyers will help push you into that corner and a lot of other reasons will help you know, kind of push you to that corner. Don't fall for that, right? Um, as, as, a, as a safety professional, you're, you're in a very interesting position, right? You're kind of in that, that balancing act, right? Between protecting your organization, protecting your employees, right? And I don't mean to make it sound so, it's, there shouldn't be a disparity there between those two things, right? Really what's good for one is what's good for both usually. But some organizations have a much larger gap <laughs> between those and you'll discover those as you go through your career that you'll realize that maybe there's some organizations that 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 need to learn a little bit more than others but that's another it's a whole other side rant um the the general advice that i would give you would just be to 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 do what these folks are telling you uh, to focus on relationships to go out and learn about how work normally happens right don't go out with the procedure in one hand uh, and a stick in the other and try to affect change that way uh, there's a lot of reasons why we can get in, you know, we can get into rules and autonomy and all this kind of stuff. This isn't the safety differently, safety two conversation per se, but you have to understand that, uh, again, there's a reason if you go out there and find that things are not in compliance, there's a reason why they're not, right? People are developing efficiency. People are having to take workarounds. There are reasons why, right? It's not that people are going out there and choosing to just be bad people, right? So go out build those relationships. Those relationships will help you to learn from normal work. That's the real goal is to go out in learning mode, not in audit mode, right? Auditing really doesn't do a lot good for us. It's going out and learning. Normal work is where all that kind of magic stuff resides. And just to the point, you don't get to normal work without relationships. Folks are not going to trust you enough to tell you. They're not, they're not going to have that conversation to say, hey, you think this is bad? Let me show you where I almost died yesterday. Right. And that's the conversations we want to be able to have. Right. But that happens through relationships. And I, I throw that challenge out to people all the time. It's kind of like my little catchphrase now, but go out for the first half an hour, first hour of your shift uh, as a new safety person, you're a good portion of your day should just be going out and learning about the people within the organization. Go out and Let me learn about their personal lives, learn about, about what's going on in their world beyond work. Yeah, go ahead, Jason. Sorry, I got a little. No, I just want to, I just want to get one, one little statement out of everybody's vocabulary, especially if you're new to the safety field. And there's a phrase that safety people like to use that says, OSHA says we should. Um, if you could just remove that from your vocabulary as a whole, um, you'll be a lot more successful starting out. There's, there's another one I want to throw out there too. Let me, let me throw this one out there because I, I, I push back on a lot of folks for this one. In our companies, when not so great stuff comes down through our companies, what's the other one we lean on? Corporate said, right? So that's one to throw out of there too, right? Don't lean in and say, well, those big bad people at, you know, or those big bad people at OSHA, those big bad people at corporate, right? You don't, you want to avoid it. That's, that's well, you can almost point. start off with a conversation too, where a lot of, where, so, where some people actually turn around and they go, okay, listen, I don't have a lot of confidence on what's going on. I got put into this position. I might be new to the organization. So they feel more comfortable using the OSHA said in the, in the whole aspect of corporate said. So what would you guys encourage them to say instead, instead of using those two terminologies? I think you'd have to reflect on why do you want to say that? And if there's questions that you don't have answered, that are making it awkward or difficult for you to go out and give these messages to the workers that before you go out and you put yourself in front of the workers where you could damage your credibility, you've got to go back um, to whoever corporate is and find out more for yourself. 
um, before you're asked to be that messenger. And that's a confidence thing too, because if someone's new, they may not mm. feel comfortable doing that. Yeah, I think I think part of it. So over in the UK, it's called the HSE, um, but but I think over here we hide behind the HSE a lot of the time because we're not confident. I think confidence is a great point, Abby. Um, but I think to to kind of it's a great question, a great challenge actually. I think from Jay, but I think. I think we can still have the conversation around the guidance that we're getting from our regulators, but it, but what it needs to be, which I think is Jason's point, and if I if I'm wrong, then please correct me. But it is when we start with that is that's when it's wrong. When we go over and we say, "Whoa, whoa, whoa stop! We doing HSC or the OSHA says says do it like this, and you're not doing it like that." If you start like that, that's wrong. If you go over and you say, "Hey, how are you doing?" Talking about the work, take me through what you're doing, and then when they're explaining to you what they're doing, and then they say. You know, this is how we do it. And I'll say, well, hang on a minute. The guidance says we should do it like that. Why do you think that's not working for you? I think it's not necessarily the phrases. It's a context in how, or, or maybe the tone or the way we're saying it or all of the above probably um, in how we're kind of saying it. It's, 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 this is what the HSE say. Why doesn't that work for you? And it could be a case that your worker has just stumbled across something the, the HSE are not aware of and you get to feed back and boom, you're, you're the next big thing in safety. You never know. But we, we got prime. Uh, I just very luckily interviewed um, head of safety for the Royal Opera House in London. Yeah, and she, far, she's gone far, through a crazy kind of court case around um, noise at work. And, and they did a lot of work and, and the kind of, the, the, what they found out towards the end was the current legislation and guidance doesn't fit the theater industry. It doesn't work for the theater industry. None of it works. You can't imagine going to an orchestra pit and saying, right, you're over the upper limit for hearing protection. All violin and drum players and everything needs to wear hearing protection. And that, the, the courts literally said that to them. And they were like, well, hang on a minute, we can't do that. So sometimes the guidance doesn't fit your industry. So you just have to have that conversation. This is what the guidance says. What do you think about that? Does that work for you? It doesn't work for you. Okay, why does it not? And let's try and fix that. Well, you're actually do... completely wrong on that, James. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Actually, you, you nailed it. I appreciate it. I, I really like the discussion around kind of the shift in assumption too, right? That's, that's some of what we're talking about, right? Instead of going out and assuming that uh, for us that the standard is right or the procedure is right, always, right? There's, we take a big leap there and say, we make it a large assumption that there's only one right way to do things. And that's probably just not true, right? Um, so going out and again, back to learning from normal work, instead of going out assuming that okay, well, they're not in line with the black line, right? So the blue line just must be wrong, right? It's probably not the best approach to take, right? To go out and try to understand why all of that makes sense to not do that, right? There's a reason why all of that makes sense, right? Uh, whether that's, that's, you know, even if you're looking at stuff kind of, kind of with hindsight backwards, kind of looking at an event after the fact and going, okay, well, all of that still made sense. As, as, as you know, looking at this and going, oh, I don't see how they would not have noticed how they, how they, how they didn't see this, why they didn't do that. Uh, for those folks involved or those folks even in active ongoing work, um, all of that stuff makes sense. You walk up on someone that's standing on a bucket <laughs> trying to reach something, um, really just off the wall kind of generic example, insert generic example here, right? But for whatever reason, that's making sense to that person at the time or they wouldn't be doing it, right? So I think it's, it's that, it's, it's changing our mindset and changing you know, our, our approach a little bit by shifting our assumptions, going, okay, that makes sense to that person as ridiculous as that looks to me right now, or is way out of whack with, with the standard or our internal rules or procedures that, that, that it, it is currently. Again, insert whatever example here. There's a reason why it's making sense. And my job as a safety professional isn't to go beat and shame that person for breaking the rules or being a, you know, a wrongdoer in our organization or sinning, sinning against our, our religious documents or OSHA documents, right? Uh, but my job is to go out and understand why that makes sense. Because that's where the magic stuff's going to be anyways. The magical learning sauce is going to be right there into why it made sense. Because if you figure out why it made sense, we can actually work on modifying the behavior then instead of just going out and asking people to change their behavior. Sam, I, uh, the, I'm going to have to shoot in a minute, unfortunately. But there is a question from Pedro that I would quite like to hear what everyone uh, so if you don't mind me kind of taking over your role for a second, sorry. No, it's, it's, we um, share this role, you jump in. <laughs> but he, he said about um, what challenges we've come across when, when trying to kind of make safety a bit more fun, uh, which I, I think is a really interesting conversation. But, and now, and now I'll start off with one of mine, 
we're in a very serious job. We're, we're trying to do something that's extremely serious. We're trying to stop people dying. So how, how, can, how can you make something so serious fun? And, and, I, and I'm, I'm very lucky to have a lot of family that work in some extremely serious industries. One's an armed police officer in, in what would be a very horrible city in England that to be an armed police officer in, you're probably at the top of your career in this town. But she does a horrible job. And if you would hear the jokes and the way they approach the stuff, it's the pinnacle of, of like dark humor because they have to make it fun you know because of, it's so bad that they have to make it fun but there is a massive fine line i think between you know when you're say if i was delivering i do a lot of fire safety stuff so i'm delivering fire safety training and, and in one moment i'm talking about say the bradford football stadium fire that we had in in england and the reason we use that even now is because the video of it is so good and so powerful but it, it's harrowing it's, it's horrible to watch you're literally seeing people burn alive it's horrible it's extremely serious and then 10 minutes later in my in my training i'm making jokes around myself you know normally i'm making quite a lot of self-deprecating humor or something like that but it, i think there's a balance between now we're serious this is serious listen to this and then five minutes later it's hey we can relax now we can have a bit of fun uh, but i'd be interested to see what other people's challenges were around that I'll jump right in. I think one of the biggest challenges to making safety fun is uh, our olds. That's a uh, that's just kind of a, a, a term phased by the uh, Safety Justice League, and it's those that are set in their ways in safety. and And what happens is you you see a real um, cannibalization of our own whenever somebody tries to make something different. So when you try to make something fun, those that have been doing it this way and that way forever and years and forever, they, they, they don't look at it as a positive of finding a new way to reach new people and keep new workers safe. And they, because it's, it's not the way that it's always been done. And because it's not the way that it's always been done, therefore it can't be correct. So it has to be, it has to be eaten alive like a, like a cannibal would eat their own. Um, so that's, that's always been my biggest struggle, biggest challenge is other safety professionals. And that's really a sad thing to say that other people within our profession are the ones that I've had the biggest struggle in making safety fun with. That, that's been my biggest challenge. Similar to that olds thing, I was gonna say, like if we're going with word association, what's your biggest challenge? I would say grumpy people. So basically that would be like the olds, you know, people that are like, oh, why, why, are, why is she doing this? This is stupid. Um, how is this going to help me learn? What am I doing here? What's the point? Um, and so I think if we're going to use like games and activities and jokes that we really need to make sure that, um, that we're confident in what we're presenting because there will be pushback. There will be people that are like, no, I'm not doing this. So you need to have some backup plans, but also, you know, read the room, right? Um, always have different uh, things in your back pocket when you're, especially like a longer day of training um, because, oh, I like that cave people thing. Who just said that? I saw it pop up. Um, citizens against virtually everything. Yes, those are the people. <laughs> um, you're going to have those people that are contrarians like to everything that you're going to try and do in the training setting. So um, again, I guess I just go back to confidence that you're confident in what you're teaching, you're confident in what you're speaking about, and that you're confident in the activities that you're about to facilitate in a set, in a training setting. Cause it's going to happen. <laughs> Sorry about that. Trying to get unmuted there. I'm struggling now. I lost my, my space bar, <laughs> but mine's, mine's similar. I, th I think you, I think you guys are spot on. It's, it's just that, right. Um, that really hits, hits home Jason in particular, because um, no matter we're, we're kind of talking around safety entertaining, but as we go down the path of doing anything a little differently in the safety space um, I've done, I've, I've sit around, I went around and trained tons of human and organizational performance fundamentals courses and the vast majority of the folks that go, ah, is other safety people, right? It's, it, it's the people that you're going, you're my people. Really? <laughs> you know what yep. I'm telling you. <laughs> Haters. Because, 
right. And it's, it's, it's not even too much of that. And I'll, I'll even give a, I think there's a lot to be said about, I don't, I don't like calling it converting people, but giving folks the information and allowing them some time to come to their own conclusions about it. And they'll usually come up with, with in, in at least a similar space that we usually, most of us will fall into. Right. Uh, I like the way that, that our friend Pedro on here that's asked a couple questions, haters to likers, <laughs> right? <laughs> to, to at least, you know, give them the information, give valid information, talk about it, continue to have those conversations. And most folks, even grumpy old safety people, right, will eventually come along <laughs> at some point. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't mean to be ageist in that in any way. I, 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 love the, I love the term that the Safety Justice League does use around old, and it, it has nothing to do with age, right? It has everything to do with mindset. Um, but I think it is that it's so interesting because as you go out and I, and I, you know, I talk about doing things differently with leaders, when I talk about doing things differently with executives, when I talk about doing things differently with foremen and crew supervisors and all these different folks, frontline employees, they're like, yeah, please, that sounds great, different, cool, it's, 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 it's neat, it's more fun, it's entertaining as we're <laughs> talking about, it's different, it seems like it might, might garner us some different results, right? It seems like a lot of the other professions within our organizations and with what we do, they, they understand that concept that we can't just keep doing the same things and expect to get a different result. But for some reason, when it comes to our own, it seems like we keep trying to go down this path of doubling down. If we just do the old things we've always done harder, then we'll finally get a different operational outcome. And that's just not true, right? Our, our systems are tuned to give us the results that we're getting currently, right? If we don't change things on the input side, the output's not going to change, right? We have to start working over here a little bit, i.e. doing things a little differently, right? So I, 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 that one hits me like right here, right? That one hits me right here because that's something that I encounter almost daily, right? And I'm not saying that, uh, I think we can all uh, be adult enough to admit that we're, none of us are right about everything, right? I think dissent is a great thing. I think pushback is a great thing. I think open and honest conversations. Those, some of those grumpy folks, they just pretend to be grumpy. They've got a good heart, right? A lot of those folks are actually telling us a lot of really good stuff. Um, but some are just grumpy for the sake of being grumpy back to the, to the cave people. I like that. <laughs> I like that as well. So I think there is something there to be able to how we tune ourselves to, to really listen to the folks that we need to kind of get that input from maybe tune out the ones that we don't, you know, uh, there's something to be said there, but that's, that has been my biggest challenge as well is how do we bring other safety folks around? And I, for me, it's just been through conversations. It's been continuing to have the conversation, continuing to have the dialogue. Uh, you know, at some point, you know, I, I'm, I'm one of those folks, as with most probably, that as long as we're having a constructive conversation, I'm all for it, right? As soon as it turns into, I don't like you because of what you said, I shut down, right? And rightfully so, right? So I think there's something to be said about keeping that conversation open, continuing to have that conversation with the dissenting voices because they're going to give us a lot of good, valuable stuff too. Uh, but then again, at some point, maybe saying, okay, that's enough. Uh, as long as you're not actively opposed to me, I don't really care. I'm just going to keep moving forward. So there's, there's something to be said there. I see Brent's comment um, in the chat. And I think that that's really where a lot of us are coming from that, you know, we don't really care about the rates. We don't care about the numbers. We just, we're caring about the people. And I think the problem, it's not so much that it's our mindset that's a problem. It's just that our organizations that we're in don't necessarily understand that. And so if we're saying, hey, I don't care about zero, I don't care about the rates, people at your organization would be like, what? What kind of safety person are you? Um, but I think like if we can figure out how to communicate with those executives and like start to move the needle on it so that they understand like, it's not that I don't care. It's just that if we're focused on, on certain things like those numbers that we're not actually going to have real improvement. Um, so I think there needs to be a lot of like reflection. I'm sure a lot of us that are employed, we're just happy to be employed right now. And um, you kind of have to work with what you have. So um, I think there's still room for these mindsets at organizations that kind of have like an old, um, the overall kind of old mindset it's tough. It's a struggle day to day for a safety professional. I get it. But I think that there's things you can do in modifying your communication and um, giving them more insight into where your mindset is coming from and start to um, get them over to, to your side. Yeah, I totally agree with that as well. I mean, it, to me, it's been back to that. It's, uh, again, some of the, the hardest people to, and I, there's, it's not, I say convert, it's really not convert. <laughs> 
but the hardest folks to bring along into safety better, just doing safety a little bit better are other safety professionals um, to the point that we were talking about with the executives, with those folks I've just found. And, and, and this is, this is what I learned with those folks uh, that I translated over to other safety professionals as well. Um, especially in the, the, the air quotes olds here and with those mindsets in particular, if you continue to just sprinkle out the crumbs, right? So you take a look at this, right? Here's a link to a video. And they're going to, they're going to cuss you and say, ah, you know, when they send, they send you back some negative comments, send you back some negative feedback, you send them a book, you send them this, you send them the other thing, you know, you send them some videos, you send them, you send them a, the safety justice league podcast, right? You, you send them over to so, listening to something. And eventually you, you just continue to try to replace bad ideas or I won't say bad, not so good ideas with a little bit better of ideas. Right. And eventually in that process, you're eventually going to make some, make some headway. You're eventually going to gain a little bit of ground. There's some folks that you're never going to gain ground with. You have to, you have to admit that to, you know, we have to say that right out of the gate. There's some folks uh, that are dinosaurs and as with the dinosaurs, they will go extinct at some point, right? They'll retire out of this profession or they'll be gone in other ways, unfortunately. Uh, but that's, that's, that's the small portion of folks, right? That's just be honest. That's a very small portion. Uh, I really love the use of the general adoption curve just for any of this stuff, right? You really focus on focus on your, your your kind of middle of the curve, right? You can get a lot of folks there in the middle of the curve. So, yeah, interesting, interesting. Story. It goes back to the PR thing you were talking about at the very beginning that the safety messaging and communication you need to maybe us as safety professionals instead of digesting a bunch of safety content, um, branch out a little bit and learn about marketing and influencing and social media type of stuff and then apply those principles in your workplace not so much always having a safety conversation but it's more of like like you said the the crumbs like dropping the crumbs or sprinkling um things here and there like any any time that you're talking to a worker or like face-to-face -face interactions awesome um text video phone don't waste any opportunity um it's not like you're pushing you're pushing things on them like a bad salesperson, but that you're always just kind of like planting those ideas and um, putting things out there because then it adds up. It's like subconscious or subliminal, ha, 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 subliminal messaging to yeah. people about safety, but it's safety. So it's okay. So, so do it. <laughs> yeah. That, that repetitive exposure, right. As there, there's, there's some stuff there, right. There's actually some, some studies around that as well that we, we won't dive into too much. That's not the, <laughs> Not, not to get too nerdy here, but I think this is interesting. I like, I like this. Uh, let me see if I can get it pulled up. Uh, 12 step programs for old aholics, old aholics anonymous. I'm a recovering OSHA compliance officer. That's from the comments. I, I like it. I think that's interesting. So maybe that might be something for the safety justice league to pursue the 12 step program for old aholics. I think that'd be a very interesting course or something, right? That'd be, that'd be a pretty cool thing. <laughs> but I think that that's an interesting comment because it's, it's strange because I, I, I refer to myself a lot of times as a recovering safety professional currently. And I've shared on a podcast not too long ago that I don't want to have to say that anymore. Right. I want to get to the point where I don't have to say that I'm a, I'm, I'm an ex safety professional. <laughs> that's technically still a safety professional that I'm, I'm in recovery. Right. I think there's a lot to be said about working on that stuff. And a lot of it I think has to do with what we we're just talking about. We were just talking, there's a lot of conversation going on still about instant rates in the chat. Um, organizations have this really bizarre need to continue to focus on outputs. Right. And if we just try to focus harder on outputs, we think that we're going to change the output. Again, it just, when we say it out loud, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Right. But for some reason in our organizations, we, we continue to double down on measuring harder, thinking that measuring harder will actually cause change. Uh, if we just, would just if people would just zero harder, Sam, if they would just zero harder, then, you know, all the outputs would be zero. Just just if goal zero is the goal, just zero harder. That's that's all we need to do. <laughs> exactly. There you go. There you go. I think hopefully that's anyone it. that's just listening can pick up that like you're joking. <laughs> oh no, no, absolutely. That was that was the. I, I apologize if my sarcasm didn't come across clearly. Um, don't zero harder. <laughs> zero is, is is look when you aim for zero, you get it. You get zero reporting. You get zero honesty. You get zero uh, input from your workers. You get it. So if your if your goal is zero. You're going to get it. You're just not going to get the zeros you think you're going to get. There you go. I think, I think that's a good, I think that's a good spot to start doing our, our final, final roundabout here. I love it. I think I don't, I don't can say it any better myself. <laughs> well, let's, let's start to wrap up. If you guys don't mind, we'll go, go around kind of for uh, for closing comments here. I know James, 
Uh, James had the scoot. He had some other stuff that was going on. And I noticed we had a couple people that have had to leave as well. Um, I apologize for a little bit of the late start. We still have kind of a hard stop here though. Um, again, unfortunately, Zoom has been uh, really giving us some, some fits lately. Uh, I don't know how things are going around the country, but I can tell you in Phoenix, uh, even just gaining internet access right now is getting to be a little bit of a struggle with everything that's going on. So we'll go ahead and start. Um, I, I've, I've got a, a, an official order here somewhere, but I've got Jason looking at me on the screen. He's, he's the, my big screen right now. So I'll say around, let's, let's get final comments and stuff from, from Jason Lucas. Yeah, final comments. Real first, just thank you for letting me be a part of this. This is uh, an awesome initiative to make safety entertaining. I, I guess just have fun, guys. I mean, that's that's the thing. You know, we do we do work in a very serious environment, but we that doesn't mean we can't have fun. Build those relationships and have fun. Totally agree. Um, like Sam, you were mentioning earlier about bringing your yourself, being genuine, authentic. I think if people can figure out a way to bring themselves to the mix, um, it's going to make communicating about safety or communicating about anything with the workers that much easier if you're doing it from your genuine place of how you talk and how how you present in the workplace. Yeah, I think I think that's exactly it. To kind of throw my thoughts in there as well is is that just j just treat people like you like you want to be treated. It's, to me, it's so much of it comes back to this golden rule thing that uh, you know my, I, I can tell you my parents beat it into me. <laughs> you, you're going to treat people how you want to be treated, right? There's so much to be said there, right? Treat people with kindness. Treat people how you want to be treated. Again, go out and learn. That's that's probably the biggest pro tip that I can give anybody is don't go out again with with the rules in one hand and a stick or a carrot in the other and expect to affect change. We really, really get where we want to go through learning. That's the only tool. That's really the only thing that we have, right, is learning. Uh, anything that gets in the way of us learning is bad for us, right? Even if that's our need for compliance, it's bad for us if it gets in the way of learning, right? So we need to go out and focus on learning. We get to that learning through all of those relationships that we were just talking about. Treat people how you wanna be treated, be nice to people, be true to yourself, right? Be genuine, be open, be honest, all that stuff that we were just talking about. To me, that's really how we get to that point that we want to get to, right? That's how we make it entertaining, right? That's, if you go to work and you can be yourself and you can be open, you can be honest and it's fun, that's the definition of, of making safety entertaining to me at least, so. With, with my kind of last little ramble there, we'll go, to, uh, we'll go to Jay Allen for his thoughts. Well, I would say, if anything, first off, let me say thank you for allowing me to be a part of the board. Um, what I would say, number one, is challenge the status quo. If anything, challenge the status quo, build the safety program that you want. It might not be the one that the organization's currently looking for, but build the program that you want. As you build it, Find that super advocate inside of your company, organization, and so on, and show them some of your ideas. Have some of those discussions with them of those things that you want to do. Now, understand as we're starting to build this, you're not going to do a full momentum change in a, in a heartbeat. Just not going to happen. You have to show and prove the things that you can do as you move forward. Make the safety program that you want. Remember, all you need to do is convert one person, and that, version, that one person can actually affect many others. Thank you for taking a listen to this. I really do appreciate that too, by the way. Yeah, thank you, everyone. I, I think that's an, uh, an amazing point that Jay kind of stummed up there with find your bright spots, focus on those bright spots. And that's, that really helps a lot. So that's all we've got. Uh, I know we've, we've went a few minutes over again. I apologize for the, for the late start. Uh, please send all of that hate mail towards the zoom corporation. If you don't mind, <laughs> I know we've all been having struggles with zoom at the moment. Um, if there's nothing else, again, you know how to reach all of us. Um, you can get a hold of me through the hop nerd podcast, uh, Jason Lucas, Abby, Abby Ferry, obviously the safety justice league, uh, their website, I think it's the safety justice league.com. Is that correct? And then the podcast, make sure you check them out. Jay Allen, uh, over at safety FM as well. The Jay Allen show, all that stuff. I think the rated R safety show probably coming up soon. If I had to guess. Yeah, it should, uh, it'll be coming on right after this. <laughs> so you can, you can head over that way if you want to check out the, the, the live stream for the Rated R Safety Show. Thanks to all of you that tuned in. Thank you to all of our panelists. I look forward to doing something again like this in the future. I think it has a, been a blast. I hope that it has brought value to each and every one of you. Again, feel free to reach out. We'd love to hear your comments. We'd love to hear uh, how we can make these things better. And we'd just love to hear your thoughts on it. So thank you so much. Any way that I can, I can help you in any way, please don't hesitate 
to shoot me a message. I'm sure everyone here feels the same way. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out if we can help you in any way, shape, or form. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, all righty. That's it. Got a, got a siren going behind me. <laughs> Phoenix is on fire. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I've got. Thank you all.